Hey, welcome to another episode of HPP Innovation Week from Hyperbaric. We're going to have a broad discussion about HPP in Oceania, one of the first countries who adopted HPP early on. I would like to introduce all the panelists who are joining me uh, today. We're going to start with Alistair McLaughlin. Alistair began his career with Ernst & Young, and since then he has held roles in various industries, developing new businesses or expanding existing businesses in the food, chemicals, fishing, property development, and sporting equipment sectors. He has been involved with Pressure Food for the past 11 years, and he is a non-executive director of Tony Stuna and managing director of Johnstone Racing. He's joining me by Dr. Alistair Baxter, held research and development and business development roles for ingredient companies in the UK and New Zealand before joining football as business development manager in 2017. Alistair helps companies commercialize innovative foods that will contribute to the growth of the New Zealand food industry. And his work has included a number of development and scale-up projects on HPP, including juices, seafood, and meats. And finally, it's joined also by Matthew McKins. He has been employed in the food industry for over 25 years with various companies and has held various roles in QA, technical, production, operations, management, project management, and R&D. He's currently running an incubator for sanitarium where new processing technologies and new ingredients are being assessed, leading to new products being developed and tested in market with various trade partners. I will start off by introducing also myself. My name is Roberto Pellegrina. I am the director for Hyderabad, uh, USA director for Hyderabad. I'm gonna talk about HPP in Oceania, an early and innovative adopters of HPP technology. I would love to talk first about Hyperbaric. Hyperbaric is an international reference in the development of high pressure technologies. We're a world leader in the industrial high pressure processing equipment, HPP. Hyperbaric is, as I said, a world leader in HPP. We have 60% market share and we have just over 300 HPP systems worldwide. We have 20 years of experience focused on HPP with an average turnover of 58 million US dollars. Uh, we have just over 120 employees, and we have held just over 20 uh, research and development projects with 18 million euros invested. Uh, we have five locations. We have our headquarters in Spain. We have a, an office here in Miami, Florida. We have a support office in Mexico. We have an office in Singapore, and we also have a support office in Oceania. HPP is a global technology. As you know, uh, we have uh, pretty much 45% of the technology installed in the United States or North America. 28% is in Europe, 17% is in Asia, 5% is in Oceania, and just 1% in Africa. Well, a couple of milestones to um, talk about uh, of things that have happened in Oceania. Uh, the first patents on HPP happened in 2002 by a company called Fonterra for reduction of small and microorganisms in yogurt. Also, Fonterra had another patent in 2005 for high pressure of bioactive compounds, which led to one of the first and most innovative products way ahead of its time. That was a colostrum product, a beverage ready to eat, ready to drink. And it was a very, very successful and innovative. Uh, also, they had the first successfully commercial HPP venture, uh, named as Pressure Fruit, uh, and they installed the first unit, uh, a 55 liter unit in 2006, and later traded for a 300 liter. Alistair is gonna talk about um, uh, in detail about, about that. They are the currently la largest user and provider of HPP technology with over 840 liters of installed capacity. Also in the meeting industry, we have early adopters, Mora Max, who is now owned by Hellers New Zealand, introduced HPP in 2010, and they created the first additive and preservative ready-to-eat chicken. The technology continu continuously growing uh, at a steady pace and as widely accepted by, in by not only the industry, but also regulatory bodies. This is a, a broad map of where the units are located in both Australia and New Zealand. And just a quick market overview. We have just 15 hyperbaric units. 40% of these are 
have been installed in, in the last five years. This technology goes perfectly with the, with the clean, green, and pure image that both Australia and New Zealand have. Uh, New Zealand was the first to study HPP, currently has six hyperbaric units operating, and Australia had the first commercial adopter with uh, nine units operating in the territory. This is a um, roadmap of the applications. Where is the technology being used? So basically the technology is widely used in the juice and beverage with 24% followed by uh, meat products, then followed by uh, guacamole, then tolling services, basically companies who have the technology uh, and, and sell, the sell the services uh, to put the product through the, their machines. Then seafood, uh, R&D, ready to eat meals, salsa and plant-based products, and two categories that are uh, growing steadily, which is pet food and baby food, and also followed by the, the dairy products. The applications in Oceania are not different. 54% uh, uh, is um, uh, takes uh, juices and beverages. Then it is followed by meat products, and same with avocado products and also pet food. And that's just a tiny percent is used in dairy products. These are some of the products that you can find in Oceania. We have, uh, as I said, the early adopters, more Max, also followed by Tender Choice, another uh, company who uh, happened to put another machine there not long ago. The juices we have, obviously, uh, pressure fruit, homegrown juice, uh, impressed, and also coconut water from life. Uh, baby food, we have a company called Born Pure. Guacamole, we have uh, seen some farms, Apple Fresh, and Fresher Foods. And dips and veggie products, we have fresh to go with a range of, of wet salads, birch muesli, and chia cups. And also we have a pet food, the Kiwi Kitchen. And this year we're gonna install another, another machine for uh, another pet manufacturer. Light and Easy, who is a company that makes ready to eat meals or prepared meals, also more and match with the ready to eat products. And there we have Made by Cow, as one well, of the first milks uh, treated by HPP. And on the seafood, we have a special application on seafood, green lead mussel. Um, uh, they extract the oil coming out of the mussel to do um, uh, pharmaceutical products. So this is a broad picture of what's happening in the industry. My name is Roberto Pellegrina, and I would like to now introduce Alistair McLaughlin, who is gonna talk about uh, his uh, story with pressure food. Welcome, Alistair. Thanks, Rob. Um, so Pressure Food uh, commenced over a decade ago. Um, as you mentioned, we, uh, we were the innovators of, uh, of HPP, um, a commercial HPP within Australia. And, uh, um, and we really pioneered our business uh, out of the, uh, uh, the CSIRO, the, the uh, National Research uh, Organisation that uh, quite simply by visiting an open day, introduced our business to the technology and uh, and resulted in uh, in the first uh, uh, machine being acquired. Um, our, our business currently, uh, we've got 28 full-time uh, staff. We utilise up to 24 casual workers uh, uh, during the year, uh, particularly uh, in the, the, the busier months when uh, uh, we're, uh, we're using afternoon and, and, and night shifts. Um, we're, uh, we're one of those businesses that... Um, we, we, we run pretty lean, and, uh, um, but that's uh, and, enabled us to uh, uh, generate more than 10 years of positive earnings and uh, uh, keeping our shareholders happy with, uh, uh, with increasing dividends each year. In the last 12 months, we, uh, we opened a new facility in Sydney, uh, and uh, we, uh, we started with just the one machine and have expanded that to, uh, to two machines, which is a model that we find works extremely well. Um, you know, every, I think everyone knows that um, uh, HPP machines are not the easiest to operate and, uh, and having the two machines enables us to guarantee uh, our, uh, our customers that, uh, you know, they can be processed within 24 hours of, uh, for their tolling. In Melbourne, the facility there is, uh, is mainly set up for juice production uh, with uh, presses, fillers, labelling, packing lines. We produce a, a wide variety of products from uh, little 50 mil shots up to, to 12 litre bladders uh, and also provide toll processing to, to third parties. 
Um, so on the HPP front, we have uh, have the four machines, uh, two of the hyperbaric 300 uh, machines. One of them's the integrated machine as, uh, as in the picture. And then up in Sydney, we have uh, two hyperbaric 120 machines. And Sydney is just toll processing at the moment. However, we're working through the, uh, the development um, of, uh, of some, some new uh, products, hummuses and dips that will become the base uh, uh, business for the Sydney, uh, Sydney operation. Uh, our brands, we, we, we have quite a number of brands, uh, but uh, the main ones are the, the Pressure Fruit, which is the, the brand that we commenced the business with um, back 11 or 12 years ago um, and uh, remains um, our strongest brand and most recognised brand. Uh, we also, uh, six or seven years ago, uh, uh, developed the, the YOLO brand, You Only Live Once, uh, where it's a nutrient-packed juice that's vegetable and fruit juice. Um, uh, and, and by being able to use HPP, you can maintain that, uh, that natural taste um, and, most importantly, the, uh, uh, the nutrition. Uh, as mentioned, um, we, we will contract juice manufacture for, uh, for third parties or HPP toll process for third parties. And over the last um, 11 or so years I've been involved uh, uh, with the business, uh, uh, it's extraordinary. The, the diverse uh, products that we have processed and continue to process to this day um, because we, we've invested in the technology and, and we're willing to share it with third parties that are a lot, you know, a lot of them are a lot smaller than us and, uh, and they, uh, they, they, they don't have the uh, uh, capital to invest themselves, but they, they get to access the technology. Um, at the end of the day, uh, for us, HPP, it's all about taste. Uh, our pressure fruit juices, our pink lady apple tastes just like a pink lady apple. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's what uh, the advantage uh, from our perspective uh, over all other technologies of preservation uh, is uh, maintaining that, uh, that original taste that you can't do with any other technologies. Um, and I've just uh, at the end there included um, my, uh, my contact details for anyone if there is any uh, interest in uh, uh, finding out some more about, uh, about our business and what we offer. Um, so I'd now like to uh, uh, hand over to uh, Alastair Baxter. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and, and thanks for having me. Um, I work for the Food Bowl. This is our building here, and we're part of the New Zealand Food Innovation Network. We are a government-supported organisation with four complementary facilities around the country. And our mandate from the New Zealand government is to grow the New Zealand food industry. So we help companies with innovation and also with commercialization and scale up. Basically, the companies can use our equipment and our facilities, our accreditation and the advice that we give them um, to innovate and to scale up. And it's quite a unique model. So smaller companies are using us for R&D and often commercial runs as well. Um, through our factory units. And then the larger companies are really using us to de-risk and move into new areas, such as new technologies and new product categories. So HPP has been a part of this um, organization since, the, since it started in 2011. Um, with regard to HPP in New Zealand, um, we have, um, there are a couple of HPP units in in Auckland, which is the largest city in New Zealand, uh, as well as the, the unit that we have here, which is a 55 litre one. And um, there's a big juice company now in Hawke's Bay, which has got quite a large market share, which has um, several HPP units down there. And then in Palmerston North, um, part of our network is Food Pilot, which has the R&D Innovation Centre and, and a small bench scale unit. In Nelson, in the South Island, um, MacLab used the HPP unit for mussel shucking. And we believe there's, a, there's another pet food, there's a pet food company in Christchurch that's using it for raw pet food. So yeah, that's, that's really it for us. Um, I'll hand you over to, I believe it's Matt next, is it? Or is it uh, Alistair? No, I think it's to me. Thank you. Uh, 
thanks for inviting me, Rob, to this. And hi, Alistair and Alistair. Um, I work for Sanitarium, uh, who, whose products will be well known to anyone who lives in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we're a major uh, food manufacturer with a couple of sites around Australia and also in Auckland. And uh, I guess we're the new boys on the scene with regard to HPP. And the reason we've uh, started having a look at it is that um, being a company that's been around for 100 years, we have a very uh, large investment in a very large UHT platform uh, and for a cereals manufacturing business. But we've been quite um, purposeful about making sure we understand what else is going on out there in the world with regard to technology and ingredients. So we've set up an incubator uh, which is part of the R&D group of Sanitarium. And uh, the purpose of that facility um, that I run is to basically have a look at um, new products and new ingredients and actually commercialise them on a low manufacturing footprint, uh, low cost, and just test the market to see what uh, may or may not work for Sanitarium. So Sanitarium's core ethos is that whole food uh, eating and plant-based eating and um, so the smoothie product that we've actually uh, have out in the market at the moment uh, is uh, got a five part nut, seed, grain, fruit, vegetable uh, product that we're running through HPP and um, we currently have that for sale with 7-Eleven around the country and we're also researching some other products uh, both solid foods and other liquids that we might be interested in as part of that overall ethos for sanitarium. Um, the main thing, I guess, that um, the business also wants us to do is understanding uh, consumer trends um, and, and monitoring those and, and obviously the insights that come with that about where consumers might want to be in 10 and 20 years. So for a company that's 100 years old, uh, obviously it's important that we just don't rest on those laurels and we need to understand where things are moving to. So that's pretty much why the incubator has been set up and it's quite a privilege for me to be able to be a part of that and run it. So. Uh, thanks for your attention. That's quite brief, but I'm sure we'll uh, have lots more to discuss in the next part of the thing. So I think I'm handing back to Anthony. Right. Thank you so much. But thank you so much, uh, Matthew. Thank you, everyone, for uh, your presentation. Um, I would like to start with uh, a couple of questions to, to, to get this conversation going. And um, one of the questions I'd like to ask is, how do you learn about HPP and why did you decide uh, to implement it? And I guess this first question probably, uh, I would like to start with Alistair, who is the oldest one using the technology, not the oldest one, obviously, but the oldest one using the technology. And I, I, uh, he's got a very interesting story. And then um, also I'd like to uh, see if, um, if um, the rest of the team will also, also like to, to add a little bit on, on, on the decision of implementing HPP. Yeah, so look, for, for our business, um, it, it really began literally with a CSIRO open day where uh, they, uh, they had a, a, a very small HPP machine that I think was something like about, about 25 or 30 litres and uh, and they were they were uh, presenting the technology literally to open to the public and uh, and by attending that open day it, um, it it exposed our business to to the technology and some some interesting concepts came out of that and over the sort of the next 18 months uh, um, some trials were were performed and uh, and I've got to say, there were there was a lot of failure before there was success. Um, and really, the the, the original concept of uh, of fruit uh, purees, uh, it, it was it was worked out pretty early on that uh, that, that the uh, um, the the financial side of it wasn't going to stack up. And uh, and then uh, um, sort of as a last resort, juices were trialled, and uh, and obviously. Uh, and that's where the business, the path of the business took, and uh, um, and hasn't really uh, looked back since. So um, you know, but it's interesting that you know, just from a basic uh, open day from a uh, uh, a national research organisation can create effectively a whole new industry. It, it proves that those research organisations do have a, a very valuable place uh, um, in in development of new technologies. <laughs> Yeah. 
And Matt, what, what was your thought process about uh, HPP and implementing HPP in, in your um, uh, for sanitarium? Well, we'd done a technology review actually worldwide and had a look at what some of the up and coming technologies were for food processing. And um, we'd also, uh, some of us had discovered uh, Alistair's pressure fruit product, Alistair, which is a great product, and uh, understood what was going on there with the taste uh, that Alistair's gone through. So I think I uh, reached out to you at that time, Rob, and uh, had you come meet with us so that we could start discussing it. So really, we wanted to make sure we understood what the technology was. Um, and it still may or may not be part of our future, but um, at this stage, you know, we want to be involved in it and uh, certainly keep learning and understanding it. Right, okay. And the same question to you, Al. Um, um, from all the technologies that were available at the time when the football was, you know, uh, commissioned to, to, to be part of this uh, um, food industry, to support the food industry, why uh, HPP was considered part, uh, as part of that technology that needed to be in uh, that football? Well, we're an innovation and commercialization center, so it made sense for us to have several technologies that were at sort of the leading edge of um, where food was going. And HPP was seen to be one of those technologies, so that decision was made based on that. But also, um, it was felt that it would complement a lot of the, um, the food industry um, subsectors that we have in New Zealand as well. Right. Okay. Uh, and I guess also HPP, um, it's in line with what consumers are looking for these days. Uh, you know, they, they know additives, no preservatives. I think that that's uh, that goes hand in hand with, with those uh, needs, uh, yep. I think. Now, okay, I'll, I'll like to move to the, to the second question. Uh, <clears throat> what are the most important benefits of HPP for your products? And I'll probably um, start with Matt. Yeah, look, taste and freshness, obviously, are two big call outs. So we, with the UHT platform we have, we certainly can make a range of long life plant milks uh, and they serve a purpose in the market. And we're obviously very strong in the grocery channel with those, but um, we're also quite aware of what consumers are after for fresh and convenience. And, um, you know, so exploring this technology, Roberto, to make sure that uh, we understand the benefits, but the, the easy way to answer that is taste and freshness. I think um, yeah. that's easily the standout benefits of HPP. Yeah, okay, I guess Alistair has that very clear. It's also included in his presentation. It's all about taste. Is that uh, what you firmly believe, Al? Oh. Yeah, look, it's it's been, um, you know, I, I think, from, you know, I, I use the analogy when I first uh, became involved in, uh, in pressure food and, uh, you know, I grew up on Granny Smith apples, whereas uh, a lot of other people like the the red pink lady apples. And you know, when when you produce a product, an apple juice that pink lady is one flavour and Granny Smith is a distinctly different flavour. You know, I love the Granny Smith apple because that's what I grew up on and like. You know, uh, whereas whereas normally, you know, all you could ever buy in the past was just apple juice that to me was just it tasted like burnt rotten apples, and so I, I, I never really drank it. Uh, but as soon as, as as soon as you know you you could tell the fact that that by variety you can end up with a completely different tasting product, it was glaringly obvious that this technology was in a league of its own. Uh, so, right. you know, it's and that's why we always talk about taste um, because uh, you know we're the only people that produce a pink lady apple and a Granny Smith apple that taste totally different because it just tastes exactly like you're eating it. Okay, um, um, I'll, from from your point of view, and, and this uh, obviously what you you can um, also comment on, on this, but I'd like to uh, hear your point of view of from all the customers and all the industries or the all the companies, sorry, that you uh, uh, get through the uh, football. Is this uh, the same? Uh, these companies looking the same the same thing? It it really depends what product they're talking about, but certainly this consumer perception of raw as a benefit um, and, and something that they're looking for is definitely across all of the things that have been looked at, I, I think, um, recently, um, you know, because it's not just freshness, it's the, this raw perception that um, people get. So if, they, if they're presented with a juice that's raw and one that's um, pasteurized, they, they automatically will, uh, will often favor that raw juice because they, oh, in their mind, it's, it's going to be better for them. Right. Okay. 
All right. Um, I would like to go to the to another question. Uh, what are the most unique training HPP applications uh, that you've seen or you you've developed, or especially you all? You have uh, uh, a very big tolling uh, facility. You, you uh, without telling much, uh, uh, what are the most unique training applications or products that you have put through, and also you um, all you of course without breaching any. Any uh, confidentiality agreement, of course. Yeah, I think maybe I could talk about the opportunities, I think, for New Zealand, um, because I, I can't really talk about projects that we've done in, in much detail. Yeah. But I think, you know, um, the export of raw juices and purees from New Zealand, I think, has got a lot of potential, um, right. you know, because we're, we're, we're very big on that horticulture and, and agri space, and we export a lot already. So it's, um, it's about adding value and, and 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 getting some more value out of some of the things that we're we're growing. Um, they, we're also we have lots of advantages in terms of um, grass-fed meats as well. In New Zealand, our our livestock is fed, is fed on grass all year round, and that um, if we can um, combine that with HPP technology um, with some of the cooked meats, um, there's definitely potential for that in the future as well. Um, the raw pet food. Um, trend is is very much um, in mind as well for the pet food industry, which is a very big industry for us here, and a lot of exports again coming out of pet food. So that's certainly something I see uh, more work being done in. And then um, we're also uh, involved in doing a lot of work on bioactives and natural extracts, where you're trying to preserve the uh, the bioactivity, and, and sometimes heat destroys that. So if um, can use HPP for that type of application, there's certainly potential. So, right. uh, yeah, does that answer your question? Certainly. <laughs> what about you, Al? Um, um, what, what do you see in the future? Like, what do you think it's, uh, what are the trends uh, in, in your area of, of tolling? What, what are you looking at right now? What are you seeing on the market? Look, look there's, um, it's a difficult one because obviously, yeah, particularly with all the confidentiality and things of that sort, but yeah. uh, there, there are some seriously unique products that are currently being processed. Um, yeah, I, I'd love to be able to share it with you, but it, it, yeah, it's something that, yeah. uh, that the third, you know, third parties, uh, they, they, they try to stretch the boundaries and um, yeah, we, I must, over particularly the last, I think it's probably because of all these lockdowns. People are people who are sitting around and and thinking outside the box, and and yeah, you know, they've come to us with some of the most bizarre products that uh, don't necessarily always fit the mold of HPP. Um, and 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 I always say to people, you know, it, it might not fit the mold, but you know, if you try, you never know. And we have had a couple in uh, in recent times where, uh, you know, it's uh, fruits and vegetables that uh, that have have been partially prepared and then subsequently being HPP. That I think I think it has really surprised a lot of people, and um, and really it's 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 there it's there for the taking for the people that are willing to, to have a go at something that maybe you know they haven't they haven't tried before, um, because often we're finding that uh, we're getting sufficient shelf life to to expand an existing product that. May uh, only currently being uh, be being processed and sold uh, in in a local area where suddenly now it can expand out and become a national product that it that it never could previously. So, um, you know, it doesn't mean you have to suddenly get six or seven or eight months shelf life. E even if you can get to to forty days, it's enough to be able to get it across the country and and, and expose it. So, yeah, I think we're going to see more and more of that as. Um, there, there are some local products that really they'd love to to be able to get them uh, out further to uh, uh, to, to um, you know, outer regions that they haven't been able to previously. Right. Okay. Uh, I'll go to the fourth question. Uh, uh, what applications or product categories do you think it will be next? Uh, the next step, sorry, in, in the use of HPP technology, and you all touch based on on pet food. Is one of the major, uh, one of the big categories growing here in the United States, as well as uh, baby food. So um, I'd like to see if that's uh, the same trend that you guys see over there. Um, uh, you guys, I, I, I don't know, Matt, you probably, um, from your incubate, uh, incubator standpoint, 
what do you see or what do you like to um, see HPP being uh, used for in the, in the future? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, pet food, obviously. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see a few more small goods manufacturers adopt it for you know, alternative to post-pack pasteurizing. I think that, that'll come from what we understand. Uh, and to Alistair's point, I think ingredient suppliers that realise there might be a, a path to take a raw ingredient that otherwise is um, hard to distribute. And you and Alistair's right, you don't need to get, you know, 100 days on it if you can get 30 or 40 days to get it around the country. And as you guys know, Australia is a big place so uh, to get across it. So I think that's, that I could see some growth in, in, in that sort of processing, primary processing. Okay. Anyone else had anything else to add in that regard? No? Okay. We'll go to the, the to the fifth question. Uh, did you have any challenges implementing HPP in your operation? And um, obviously there's always always challenges, but I do like to talk about some of the main main challenges that you, that you faced um, in your operation. That would be that'll be good to know. Uh, um, Matt? Yeah, no, we, we're quite fortunate. So we have quite a large space uh, that uh, is for the facility and we were able to actually put the HPP machine where we wanted it and build the equipment around it without the uh, restriction, I guess, of a, a production facility. So um, on that respect, it's been quite straightforward. Yep, okay. Oh, I'm not sure you missed that, but um, uh, did you have any challenges implementing HPP in your operation? Not really, because I think for us, it's we're an innovation commercialization center. It fits in quite well with our model, actually, and it's a batch system, which actually makes it easier in some ways. Um, the main barrier, I think, for, for us with with HPP um, has been sometimes the validation requirements for neutral pH products. So it's more to do with that, that type of um, barrier than any, any issues with implementing the machinery and, and so on. Right, okay. Right, okay. Alistair, we'll have you back. Uh, can you hear us, Al? Sorry, I lost you. I'm not sure what's happening. That's okay. Uh, yes, got we you. Just, uh, we were talking about the challenges that uh, companies face when implementing, uh, you know, HPP in their operation. And obviously, we want you to be brief because you have 11 years of experience and... Um, what are the main challenges that you face, you know, when, when you try to implement HPP? Obviously, from going from a 55 liter machine up to, uh, you know, 600 liter uh, uh, or, or two 300 liter machines, it takes a lot. And uh, I would like to to see if you can explain what were the main, you know, the main challenges that you guys face when when implementing HPP. Look, uh, uh, th this is an interesting one because um, I, I, I don't think we have any problems implementing HPP <laughs> um, because the reason I say that is um, we, uh, we established our Sydney facility uh, last year during all the COVID crazy stuff. And as long as you've got enough power, uh, you, you, can, you can do anything with HPP very easily. Um, so... You know, I, the only stress I had was um, uh, uh, sitting at, uh, at home uh, uh, trying to find a premises that had sufficient power in a location that was sort of potentially suitable. So as soon as I'd tick that box, um, I, you know, we, we rolled in uh, two machines in three months, uh, had them, you know, we had, we had a few little issues where, you know, we had to deal with things that, you know, obviously we... we we, we didn't have uh, uh, the support from um, Spain to uh, um, to get everything happening, but um, we worked it out. And um, uh, so, you know, it it uh, it was it, there was a, a few challenges. You know, like anyone that, that buys any machine, even with the experience that we've got, um, you know, when you when you don't actually get to um, uh, to do a uh, a, a proper um, start up and uh, and commissioning, uh, but um, you know, re I, I think that when I consider what we started with uh, eleven or twelve years ago, um, the machines are so much more friendly, so much easier to operate, and 
you know, our, our what we, we we sort of call it our first machine, but it was really our second machine. It was our first 300. I, I say to people that basically the, um, the, the, the electrical system I'm sorry, we lost them again. Well, that's fine. Okay, no problems at all. We're, we're gonna we're gonna carry on. We're gonna go for um, the sixth question. And um, how is the current consumer behavior affecting the types of products that your company is producing? For example, clean label, sustainable supply and production methods, uh, food reduction. Uh, what objectives are companies looking uh, when implementing HPP? Uh, yeah, um, clean label, definitely. We've been getting, uh, we understand consumers are after that quite a bit. And I think consumers today understand the labels probably better than they have previously. I think that's partially to do with um, education, obviously, through nutrition. And I think partly due to the, the labeling requirements in countries like Australia and probably the US are trying to make things as transparent as possible. So. Um, it's interesting that consumers are taking much more interest in obviously what they're eating and drinking. So definitely I'd say clean label, uh, sustainable supply definitely as well. And probably a third one um, that's interesting is maybe they're starting to understand the production methods of food. Um, I'm not 100% sure that, um, you know, 10 years ago not consumers might not have been able to tell you what pasteurisation was or homogenisation was unless they had some sort of food industry background. They just saw it as words on milk often but uh, in this country but I think now they're starting to understand the, the, the methods of, of how food's produced and I think that's driving a lot of expectation in, in food products. Right now you you are you you've seen a lot of you see a lot of companies going through through the football um, is that mm. the same do you, do you see uh, sustainability obviously uh, in New Zealand, New Zealand is leading in sustainable packaging, and um, obviously sustainability is a big um, it's a big topic over there. Here in the states, we 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 start to see you know some behaviors, but um, is that in line with um, uh, with what you see the the, yeah. um, the customers you receive? Absolutely, yeah. The biggest trend we've seen over the last few years has been the move to plant based foods. Right. So. Um, as everybody is, is looking at that from the health and, and sustainability point of view. So that, that's a big trend and, and a large percentage of the projects that get done here are, are sort of leaning towards the, the plant-based areas. Okay. Um, so that's, that's definitely a big part of it. Uh, sustainability definitely with the packaging as well and, um, you know, we've, we've moved to recycled PET bottles being used. Um, and then that whole system for recycling has evolved over the last, just over the last 12 months in, in Auckland. So, so that we're getting better at recycling. So um, I'm looking forward to the bulk HPP technology coming um, more widespread as well, because that will lead to more um, improvements in sustainability, I think with the, with the whole HPP system. Yeah. Yeah, so we, as you know, we have installed one in, in France and it's currently going. Uh, they're just doing PET, uh, they're doing Tetra Packs, and obviously you can use it with any any type of, of package. Now packaging is not the issue. It's uh, and, and obviously there's a huge labor saving component uh, there uh, with the use of the bulk system. Uh, what about, as you said, um, packaging is one, one of the main things. Uh, how's uh, New Zealand and Australia in terms of, of sustainable packaging? Have you have you seen any manufacturers there moving towards that? Uh, I, I mean, man, uh, suppliers of plastic. Uh, I mean, no, no, no manufacturers. But uh, uh, how's that uh, in terms of um, packaging sustainability? Do you have any any companies there that doing that? They're doing that or no? I really don't think that we're doing a good enough job in New Zealand on that at the moment. We're probably a little bit behind and we, and that's something that this government is being proactive about at the moment in terms of, you know, punishing people that are offending in that regard and also giving some incentives. Um, so there's a bit more government in, in intervention when it comes to packaging and sustainability to try and push the market in the way that it should be going. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think Australia um, has the same problem, 
um, Roberto, with regard to um, up until a couple of years ago, it seemed like all of Australia's recycling was uh, sent offshore. And then a lot of that's closed down and through out through China. And now mm. Australia's having to look at actually recycling its own waste. And I think that's actually interesting because there's a lot of people trying to work out what that looks like and how to do that. Right. Okay. Right. Okay, perfect. Um, I'll let you go for the last question. And um, I think this is looking into the, the future. What do you see HPP in the next few years? Is that for me? Sorry. Um, anyone. Um, All right. Yeah, well, I think, um, like I said, for us, um, we want to be supporting the um, things that help with exports. And there's some obvious, obvious synergies with HPP and some of the things we're, we're exporting. And if it can add value to those exports, then that's a, that's a very important thing. And I think there's so like a lot of potential for, for purees, um, grass-fed meats, pet foods, and natural extracts. That's what I see the future being in, in NZ anyway, for HPP. Yeah, I guess Australia and New Zealand, they both have very strong market, uh, you know, export markets. You know, we have all the Middle East, all Asia. So it's quite, um, uh, they have a very, very important, um, you know, and uh, very powerful uh, in terms of um, money spending uh, countries, you know, companies that, that can pay, uh, you know, the price for a premium, a premium juice. Um, Al, what do you see uh, the HPP technology in the next uh, few years? What's your view on that? Oh, look, I, I definitely think in Australia we're, uh, we're seeing a, a, a shift with what's happening in the meat sector. There, there's absolutely no doubt that people are realising that um, you can strip out a lot of the, uh, the, the nasties um, uh, in that sector and uh, people are looking for clean label. People, people want products that... that um, um, a superior in nutrition, superior in taste, obviously, and uh, and so I think there's a there's, there's just a, a, a broad array of um, of manufacturing that um, are progressively adapting uh, and 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 realizing that the technology does have a benefit. Probably the other thing is that the cost of the technology is is continuing to come down, um, and that and that's that's enabling a lot more entrants to seriously consider it. Uh, and uh, uh, and so I, I, I only see that more and more people as they uh, uh, understand what the technology is and what it can do, uh, they'll, they'll adopt it and, and make modifications to their existing systems to enable it to, uh, um, to, to be incorporated into their business, whether it's um, their own machines or being externally um, uh, process. And we've got a lot of people that bring products to us. We then post pack it. They never ever see it again, and uh, and and it comes through HPP and directly into the supply chain. And really, the it just means that the the, the cost is, is the the HPP cost, and 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 uh, you know, maybe just a little bit more supply chain cost. It's it's not it's it's not um, nearly as material as it used to be. Right. Okay. What about you, Matt? What is your future yeah, um, yeah, I think the bulk technology that you guys are working on that was previously mentioned, interesting. Um, that'll be, again, from not only the sustainability footprint and point of view, but companies like ours, I guess, that have a large investment in a, in a front and back end UHT and then aseptic back end. Uh, you know, we wonder if there's an opportunity for certain products that you can then take through a bulk process and pack off into various packaging that don't work doesn't work currently in HPP but but might be good for the product um, it may not be a sterile product obviously uh, it's not going to be UHT equivalent but you know there, there's another whole uh, expectation from consumers about fresh and not everything has to be that way so I think that and also that that continued growth in plant-based foods I think we're going to see a lot more either uh, finished plant-based goods or raw material or intermediate products come through yeah, HPP yeah, yeah and, I, and I think that'll be important yeah yeah okay all right oh well, i would like to thank you again guys for uh making the space uh i know you guys are always busy and uh and and um uh, on behalf of the team i have everybody matthew 
Alistair, Alistair, thank you so much for being part of this HPP Innovation Week. And um, we'll probably going to be in touch very soon. Pleasure. Thanks, thank bro. you, Roberto. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, thank guys. you. Thanks.